All right, welcome to the future of digital marketing. My name is David Kinnan. I am the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications at the McGill School of Continuing Studies. And I have the pleasure this evening of being your host and asking our fine panelists, people uh, from a variety of disciplines in marketing with a great deal of experience, what we can expect in the future. Before we get started, I just want to give you a few tips to, uh, to optimize your experience. If you happen to be on a VPN, you may want to turn your VPN off as it can impact the, the audio and visual experience with the platform, which is WebEx. Uh, if you have any applications you don't need to open, you might want to close those as well. That also can help uh, with the audio and visual. We do have a chat function here, which you can see at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, make sure that when you send anything in the chat that the send to is set to everyone. We also have a Q&A and what I will ask is that if you have comments to make, go ahead and put them in the chat. But for your questions, please use the Q&A. If you don't see the Q&A, at the bottom right of your screen, you should have three dots, and that will give you the option of clicking on the Q&A. When you put a question in the Q&A, uh, other people can see that question and they can upvote. And so we will be tackling the most popular questions first. So please use the chat for any comments and the Q&A for any questions that you have. The first thing we're going to do tonight is we are going to meet our panelists. Just one more note, we are recording the session. You will receive a link to the recording within 24 hours. All right, so I will begin to hand it over to each of our panelists so they can introduce yourself, uh, themselves. Tarek, why don't we start with you? We don't hear you. <laughs> we, you missed it all. There we go. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> How are you? It's um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, my name is Tarek Riman. I'm um, the head of marketing analytics and technology at Global Vision. I work with Mike, who's another panelist on uh, this panel. Uh, I also teach um, marketing. I'm uh, an instructor in marketing at JMSB, McGill, and York University. Um, in addition to all that, I do have a few books on marketing and on the topic and have a few years Best of experience. Best-selling books, Best -selling books well, I think, right? Well, well, it's it's not cool mm -hmm. if I say it, but it's very, yeah, very it's, good it's when okay you if say, I say it, it, David. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Four-time bestseller. I'm familiar with your, with your uh, feats. <laughs> all right, um, Michael, we'll go to you next. Perfect. Hi everyone, glad to be here as well. Um, my name is Michael Malls. So, as Tarek said, I'm the director of marketing and also the director of product at Global Vision. And just so everyone knows, we are a software company here in Montreal, and uh, we're focused on uh, we're in the B2B space. So we develop proofreading software for uh, regulated companies, and so all of our marketing, you know, knowledge and expertise is is in B2B. So glad to be here. Great, thank you. Aditi, you're next on my screen. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. I am Aditi, and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at Futurepreneur, national nonprofit um, that I might talk about a little later. Uh, but I have been a previous board member on the Indonesian Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I used to work in Southeast Asia. And now I'm in North America and I moved from the B2B SaaS space into a uh, nonprofit space. So it's been a real change, but some great marketing learning there. And I miss Montreal, used to live there too. So I'm here in Toronto, but oh, I wish I was in Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great, Thomas. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas Ramaza Dow. I'm very happy to be here tonight with the I find the panel, the panelists are amazing. I, I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but uh, <laughs> I, I will contribute. Well, yeah, we decided I, you need to be here, so. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's, it's my ego that's fantastic. Thanks. I'm, uh, honest, I'm a yes. teacher. I'm a teacher. I consider myself a teacher and it's my greatest honor. I sincerely, I teach at university and I teach in CEGEP marketing. And it's great to meet entrepreneurs all of the time. Uh, I've been an agile marketing coach since 2016. And before that, I was in an agency where I met 
this wonderful gentleman here, Tarek, uh, for the second time. And we we handled a lot of campaigns, a lot of high high profile campaigns. So that's that's what I bring to the table, I think. And uh, I'm looking forward to share with you. All right, great. So I will kick it off here with the first question. Uh, everybody knows we've just had one of the uh, perhaps most unique year, years or year and a half of, of, of our lives, potentially. Uh, we know that the business world is increasingly characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And in all of us in talking about the future of marketing, the concept of agility kept coming up. So, uh, my 1st question is going to be for you, Thomas. Why is agility the future of marketing? Well, the 1st thing I want to say is that agility is is a. Has been around for about 30 years and, and I'll expand on exactly what it means for marketing. But what I want to stress right now is that the future of marketing is not just agility. It's you're going to hear what the future of agile mark, uh, of marketing is through these, these fine people on this panel, because it's a combination of everything. Uh, it's a combination of the way that we, we treat people, uh, the respect that we, we should give. Uh, I, I think Aditi is going to give us fantastic insights on, you know, inclusivity, diversity. Uh, I think B2B is essential for Michael and, and all of the tools and, and uh, how they interrelate. Eric is going to cover that brilliantly. So it's a part of it. I, I just want to stress that it's not the future. It's part of the future. So you may have heard about agile marketing. Uh, it's, it's hard to miss it these days because I think February 2nd, uh, Google came out with an article in Think with Google and it was why marketing agility is a superpower. And I, I appreciate that that sentiment, but the reality is that it's not magic. Uh, you, you will also see it in Forbes magazine over the last year, 12 articles have been written. And even if you were to do a search on Harvard Business School with agile marketing, you're gonna see seven pages of results. So obviously it's of interest to marketers and, and scholars and researchers. And it's something that people can apply very easily. So, but before we go any further, what is agile marketing? It's an organizational effectiveness strategy. So it's, it's a strategy to become more effective as an, as an organization and as individuals. And it's been used since about 2010 outside of the software development field into business functions. So you're, you're seeing agile marketing, you're seeing agile HR. You're seeing agile accounting, but it rests on a very solid foundation of 30 years, which is software development. They saw that it works. It, it, it is effective. Um, and essentially, if I had to describe it to you in 3 words, it would be. It's the way that you work. Uh, it's the way that you think it's the way that you share. So we essentially really. Going to the, to the root of what we're trying to do as marketers. And it, it, if I had 2 sentences to explain it, it would be. Um, First, talk to custom talk with customers. Sorry, not to customers. Actually, it's a two way communication. So every week, try and talk and and and, and exchange uh, to provide them value as soon as possible. It, because it, value is perceived really from the customer, and you have to show to them that 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 you care, that you're serving them, that you're not just selling to them. And the other part is internal, so collaboration breaking down the silos that may exist and focus on outcome, not just output. So earlier we were discussing, and it was funny because we very often in, in marketing, we end up slaves to the busyness, uh, meaning being busy as opposed to the business of actually providing uh, customer experiences and, and wonderful outcomes. So I would say one of the main reasons why I think Agile is going to be connected over the next few years, still connected is let's face it. We in marketing, we're not regulated as we would be, for instance, in accounting In accounting, you do something silly. You lose your license. You can't practice accounting anymore. The same applies to HR. The same applies to law. But in marketing, you're in charge of a million dollar budget. You do silly things and you still remain in the industry. So there is a sort of default de facto sort of code of ethics, code of standards, values, principles. And I think agile marketing sort of fits that bill for now. So that's why I think it's part of the future. 
if I can just um, yeah, go ahead. I just want to add to that because um, you know, working at a software company, uh, we're very close to the agile process, yeah. and so um, it, it does work really well for us. And, and I can say that I think bringing it to the marketing team has actually become you know almost a requirement. I would say, um, you know. Having having us manage our projects and our collaboration in the same approach as we do build our software um, has just brought us tremendous dividends, and you know it's helped us in the prioritization of our projects, um, having clarity in the way that we work, and I think it also brought the marketing team closer to the rest of the company since that's how the rest of the company is working. So maybe I'm a little biased since we were already working in this way, but. I think that the benefits and, and the teams that can bring an agile approach, um, you know, will end up winning. So just my two cents on it. So I want to make sure that everyone who's here this evening really understands what is meant by agile, agile marketing. Uh, if we go back to perhaps the way campaigns were created traditionally, um, you know, an agency or a firm might do some research, they get certain customer data, they make some decisions on perhaps, you know, the key, the, the audiences, the key features and benefits, they create a unique selling proposition and either in-house or with an agency, they create a campaign and then they launch the campaign. You know, if you launch newspaper ads and you launch uh, billboards, you're not really gonna get feedback and say, you know, we're gonna change our billboards tomorrow unless there's a major PR crisis. So. Um, in that sense, is that is that sort of the opposite of agile? And then I also would say that traditionally, digital campaigns, you would do all that planning, you decide on your creative, you you write your copy, you run your ads. Now we have the ability to uh, optim test and optimize in real time. So I just want to want to understand uh, in in comparison to those traditional concepts of creating everything and rolling it out. What does Agile mean concretely? Well, I would say, at least from, from our perspective, um, as we've, you know, shifted marketing practices from traditional to digital, um, that's what's really brought on the advent of, of Agile for us, or at least how I can see the comparison between them. You know, we're working through um, digital projects in similar ways that we would build a software product. So the cadence of agile and the way we gather feedback and prioritize um, can be done in that method, whereas traditional marketing maybe has a very different approach to it um, and maybe doesn't fit the agile process as cleanly. Um, but, but yeah, I feel that I feel that it's kind of come hand in hand with with a lot of just the digital marketing you know, uh, contents that we've had to produce. Um, and, and it's almost treating your marketing projects almost as, as if they're products and, uh, and treating them in, in that same regard. All right. So Michael or Thomas, um, how would you explain, you know, for example, you, you've got, you've got maybe on, on Facebook, you've got Facebook ads and you've got four different creatives and four different versions of the copy and you're testing. Is agile related to testing and optimization once you've rolled out the campaign? Absolutely. Uh, but in the bigger picture, and I will use the Facebook example that you just gave, the traditionally what we used to do in, in marketing is that we would have a yearly budget. So it's as if by magic, we knew exactly what was going to happen for the entire year. And then accounting would come on board and they would say, we will only release the funds when it's the third quarter and so on. So we would be missing out opportunities. And as that happens, uh, as we are applying agility, we're applying it in a, a format that is very familiar for uh, software developers. It's a minimal viable product. So in the sense, what can we deliver in order for the, the customer to accept it, buy it, be sufficiently happy with it, and knowing that we will be improving it as we go along with them, with their feedback. And that's sort of the exciting thing in the exchange, the value exchange of communication. And coming back to Facebook, we don't know what's going to happen with Facebook this year. So it, it might be, there are some organizations that really plan it out and per quarter and so on, but there are some opportunities to test and to run small experiments. One thing that's different about agile marketing and different about software 
uh, agility is that you get to test before. So you sort of bake in the test for your first iteration. You say, I'm going to try this out. Instead of waiting for this yearly big campaign, let's say Mother's Day, you can try it out maybe a month before, maybe even ideally two months before, and you can start to get a sense of are people responding to this? What can I, how can I improve this on Facebook? Are there better creatives that, that I should use? Are there better calls to action? And so on. And I, I would say that's one of the strongest uh, points of, of agility. Uh, Michael, I, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I relate the strongest to the, the concept of, of the MVP in, in, in marketing as well. Um, you know, it's very familiar in the world of building products, but um, staying disciplined to release as, as little of, of what's required as possible to, to get the job done um, can just allow the team to move faster. And, and, and that has a huge impact. Um, you know, when you start to really pay attention to your speed and, and sometimes on the reverse, when you, you look back and you recognize that you took too long to, to build out a, a project that, you know, it didn't really need to be uh, that heavy and, and you probably could have cut it in half. Um, you can see all the other things that you could have done with that time uh, and it has a big impact on the team and everyone around you. So. Um, I would say that, you know, the MVP being at the core of agility, um, you know, really ends up, um, you know, being, you know, the North star of, of the whole process. So if somebody marketing, we wants have, to, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. In marketing, we, we have the exact same principle. It's just a question of minimal viable campaign. Yeah. So this way you don't run your $36,000 a week campaign and find out at the end of the week, oh, it didn't work. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that, you know, executives love, especially CFOs. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to learn agile marketing, what resources would you recommend? Uh, I know I read the Lean Startup by Eric Reese. That was my introduction to agile and especially the idea that, you know, I think traditionally there maybe was an idea that, you know, we're going to run a campaign and it's going to work. Uh, the, the Eric Reese approach is anything you do is an experiment. You've got a hypothesis and you're testing. So you're doing the minimum viable campaign to see if your experiment works. Is that a resource you would recommend? And what else uh, is out there that you would recommend for marketers? I would definitely for marketers specifically, one of the first books that was, uh, you know, groundbreaking was uh, from Scott Brinker. So uh, growth, growth marketing. Uh, to this day, it's still it's still applicable. And Scott Brink, Scott Brinker is extremely well known uh, worldwide. So he's one of the, and and I happen to to work with him because he's uh, he's part of the leadership team of the Agile Marketing Manifesto. I was invited to be part of of the Agile Marketing Manifesto. Uh, the another book, a fantastic book from Jim Ewell. He was one of the signatories of of the uh, Agile Marketing Manifesto originally in 2012. It's the six disciplines of agile marketing. Another thing I would invite you to do is uh, a fabulous community in the UK from uh, Pam Ashby, uh, Rachel Chapman, and Nadine Rochester. They've been uh, hosting this community for a, a little, well, close to two years now. And, and they, they cover topic every single week. It's free to join. It's a meetup. Um, I, I would highly recommend that. Uh, I also try to be active with Michael Seaton of the University of Toronto in terms of emerging research. Uh, the most the, the most impressive research that I've found to date comes from Italy, from three wonderful uh, PhDs. These ladies are extraordinary: Ludovica Moy, uh, Francesco Cabidou, and uh, Birgit Hagen. Uh, I I get to speak to them uh, regularly, so that's one of the bonuses of, of doing uh, research and being active. I would also reach out to what Michael gave us a really very good uh, lead. Uh, reach out to your IT, reach out to your software development. Mm -hmm. they, they've been practicing this for a very, very long time. They might give you pointers in terms of how to flow that within your business practice. So that's where I would start. Great, great resources. Thank you. So I touched on the past year, the pandemic. We've talked about the need to be agile. Um, Coming out of the pandemic, 
with uh, you know the vaccine rollout i know people are starting to travel more people are people are out uh, shops movies restaurants how do you think the pandemic has changed marketing and what do marketers need to know let's say in the short term going forward who would like to tackle that first well i could just say um from from experience really in this past year is um, pretty much all of our traditional campaigns were uprooted and upended, you know, in a, in a flash. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of events specifically, we, we did have a, a big trade show circuit that, you know, we'd lean on and, and traditional marketing was a big part of our mix. And so um, we just, suddenly had that whole arm eliminated and we had to look for for other ways to kind of keep the similar momentum and and so for us we we started to turn towards a lot of digital events you know s similar to just you know webinars you know just like this and and uh, just just digital talks uh you know we wanted to put more on ourselves and so um we find that that really you know a lot of a lot of what's changed too we feel that it um it's here to stay, even if events do kind of, you know, as they're starting to creep their way back in, um, we actually find ourselves questioning, um, you know, the value more and, uh, and, and I think it's allowed us to question, you know, the cost of a lot of these, these things too, since, um, running everything digitally is, is much cheaper and, and the best part is it's all trackable. So, um, you know, it definitely has, um, given us or forced us into a retrospective on on the way we run you know a lot of our campaigns i have something to add to that yeah please <laughs> for sure with digital like the minute you start to spend in it it's exciting because there's so much audience you can reach so fast for sure at a at a relatively economic price but it does drive up your cost per lead or you know some of your kpis get all skewed up so i have to say that was a learning on our part too of oh, okay now we can shift all of our marketing dollars towards digital because we had so many in person invite events that we had to completely transform but keep in mind that does shift your goals and that you need to be mindful of in a really stringent organization in a more flexible place sure the other thing i think should um, be a key learning coming out of this is of course diversify right so diversify and if you don't have a huge budget test and then scale up so we tested out three or four channels and initially, because we weren't sure, shifting to a completely in-person event and workshop that goes on to a week to a virtual setting in two days was one of our changes. And that um, was a huge uh, shift in mindset, right? So we had to see how do we get involvement here and we wanted to test out some avenues that we kind of hypothesized around. But the minute we saw one work, we'd scale up, we'd spend more dollar, we'd invest a little bit more energy and resource into understanding why, who, what, when, where. And then in the ones that didn't perform as well, we shut them down because you don't have as much time. So diversify and then test and scale up. Sounds very agile. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to add a few things, David, if you don't mind. Yes, please. So um, one thing I would mention is as, as good and as positive, I would say from a digital standpoint, the pandemic or this, like the, the the digital transformation that you've seen, it is extremely positive. The truth is it did expose the Canadian market on a global scale and the competition has become global. I think McGill maybe would be the first to, to highlight that as an local educational institution in Canada, uh, the competition was mostly Canadian, but when everything switched online, we, we literally the education got exposed on a global scale. So that global competition is on one side and also what we're seeing what i've seen a lot and what i've read about a lot is that the market became oversaturated and the truth is a lot of what wasn't digital has became digital so the truth is and this is what i've seen transformed through my education through my teachings but also through work on a day-to-day -day, what worked before the pandemic did not work during the pandemic and even if you were already in digital you needed to innovate much more. You needed to, of course, you needed to be way more agile. And I really love what Aditi said, and I love what Mike said, because uh, there's something I always tell my students. I tell them a quote from Game of Thrones, which, which, which is fight every fight everywhere. 
And I genuinely mean it because I tell them when you're trying to optimize something or you're trying to test the campaign, just try to make sure that you covered all angles, try to make sure that you're using every single bit of information out there to your advantage, whether it's analytics, whether it's your campaign, whether it's um, resources, whether it's a PDF that you've created, anything that you can use to tip the needle in your in your advantage, you're better. It's no longer a game of massive competition and, oh, I'm looking in the rear view mirror at the competition. The truth is you might be ahead of your competition today. Tomorrow morning, you might wake up, you, you, they might be ahead of you. And and things have changed and have become faster. And truth is, as, as ironic as it sounds, we started with Agile, I'm gonna go bring it back to Agile. The more Agile, the more responsive you are to, to the market, the, the, better, the, better, the better off you are. And uh, the, for me, what, what shocked me the most about the pandemic is I would, I like to use that phrase a lot as well is um, I didn't know what I didn't know. And honestly, the more, the more I started digging deeper into what's been done at the global scale and bring it on a local level, I got to learn more as well. So in a nutshell, we, we got exposed on a global level and we had to up our game and we had to learn faster and it had to be more agile. Yeah. So. We know technology has uh, transformed marketing and continues to transform marketing. Uh, pretty soon, we might have uh, entire campaigns uh, created by AI. I've seen offers for, you know, an AI can write all of your ads. Uh, what would you say, Tarek, is going to be the influence of, of technology in the future, of AI in the future, and specifically on the things that you specialize in, like SEO and analytics? I think you're, are you muted again? Huh. Oh, it's, if you. I'm, I'm good. Am I good? You're good now. <laughs> okay. I was good all along. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so here's, here's how I would lay, lay it down. Um, when it comes to AI and technology both together, I'm going to tackle this as a whole and, and, and talk a bit about analytics talk a bit about maybe SEO, which I do on a daily basis. Um, there's, there's a saying by, I don't know if you know, a, an author called Yuva Noah Harari. He wrote a book yeah. called <laughs> Sapiens. I keep yeah. quoting this guy. I think Mike is just laughing because I, I keep like blabbering about books and, 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 and especially this one. And, and in the book, he says something, which is uh, freaked me out. Like literally when, you know, when you read something and you close the book, you're like, okay, I'm just going to go to bed. I had enough for the day. I, I didn't need to read this. I'll read it tomorrow morning. In the book, he says, we're heading towards a future that is the, our, where the biggest problem that we're going to be facing is not unemployment, it's unemployability. And as, as uh, the, the crazy part about it is, uh, we are heading this aut the automation, AI, et cetera. Is, I've been witnessing it, I wouldn't say from now, I've been witnessing for the past 10 years. I think I worked with Mike, uh, with uh, Tom 10 years ago, and I can tell you this, whatever needed whatever, when, let's say from an SEO standpoint or an SEM standpoint, whatever needed 10 people to work on one thing now could be done by one person or, or half a day by one person per week. Uh, a lot of what we've seen in marketing has been automated already. If, if you run paid campaign, paid search campaigns, Facebook campaigns, David, you're aware of it. We've worked on similar things together. A lot of things are being automated. So our work are being, is being done for us. So the positive aspect of all of this, I would say, is that we're being freed to think more strategically. And uh, you said AI can write you ads, actually AI can write you content. Uh, jokes aside, can write you good content. Uh, Mike and I, Mike and I had a discussion like three, four weeks ago and he's like, Tarek, I need, like we need to create more. I was telling him we need to work on more content. He's like, try to find someone. And I was looking for, for a content writer and I swear to you at one point I was about to come back to, to Mike and I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's try on this AI thing. Let's, so imagine there's really good content writers from an, like an, a good content writer in AI, AI that writes SEO optimized content. Now, I wouldn't go that far because SEO is about driving value. But what I would do is, the way I would say it is um, the low hanging fruits are being addressed. A lot of things that should be automated are being automated and I'm pro that. And then we're left to be doing the more strategic work for us, for ourselves. And, and, and I think it's a very positive thing. Now, from an SEO standpoint, I would say there's no more tricks. Uh, people always, and especially students or uh, people in general, will tell me, Tarek, oh, am I allowed to do this still? Am I allowed to do this still? The best way I can tell you this is 
the more I read and I read about SEO every single day, there's no more tricks. Uh, AI is smarter than us. Google has already proved that it's smarter than you. If you just joined the industry and you want to trick Google and you think you're the first one to do so, think twice. So you're every, every, like Sting once said, every step you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. This is, this is pretty much the case. So do not do any tricks. Try to drive value, bring benefits, concentrate on user behavior when it comes to SEO, when it comes to your marketing. And that's the safest route you can go. All right. I want to go back to the concept of employability. I know you mentioned the word strategy, but I'm wondering if we are thinking about how to be valuable marketers in the future who are employable. Strategy, strategic thinking is maybe something that's going to be difficult for AI. What do you mean when, when, if we break down employability, what are the skills that, you know, what's, what are the things in marketing that only humans can do? Okay. I love, I love this. So I, I love it when I know the answer to the question, I'll be like, are you sure you want to ask? Are you sure you want to ask? Me that one? I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, put it this way. Um, also, also from Yuva Noah Harari, he's, he talks about it, but I'm, I'm going to build on what he says. 90. Five, I, I do I do a presentation when when I sometimes uh, when I do presentations at universities about data I, I talk about a specific concept and I, I talk about two things when it comes to the employability of the future one of them I start by facts and I say 0.5 percent of the data worldwide has been analyzed 0.5%, which means 99.5% of the data worldwide has not been tapped into. And I would bet the same thing for marketing. Um, there's that one, that's one aspect. So let's start with the facts. There's a need to analyze data. There's needs for more marketing data scientists. There's need for people with strong knowledge of concepts, consumer journeys, markets that are able to link raw data, information, insights, dashboards with what's happening in the market and their knowledge in the marketing industry together and come up with specific strategies aligned with both. I believe that aspect is not going to be replaced in the next 10 or five years, or I would say even 15 years that that unique ability for us as human make, beings to make decisions based on what we know, our analysis, collecting information, use data, using AI for our advantage. I would say that's the one thing I would not see replaceable at all anytime in the future. So if I am to recommend one specific skill for the future, I would say like, hey, make sure that one of your, in your arsenal, you at least have strong grab on data, strong grab on analytics, strong, strong grab, grab on that. Because without that, and, and I think um, Richard Strokes from Ad Guru once said, rushing into campaigns and rushing into marketing without data is like burning your money and throwing your money away. So it's true now, it's gonna be true in the next 10 years. Great. Thomas, you wanted to add something. Uh, there's barely nothing to add, but one thing <laughs> that AI is not good at is uh, sarcasm. It's not mm. good at humor. It's not good uh, at lies. So uh, when you consider, uh, and just adding to, uh, what Tarek said so brilliantly, and I completely agree with him. Yeah, develop develop your skills of you know being able to synthesize, to analyze, to to find the angle, and to to just shift it to the benefit of your customers. And and sometimes customers are telling you, no, I really don't want to to buy, and and they're smiling, but they're not smiling. So I think that's one aspect where there's a lot of room for for alert marketers. And that can that can bring a lot of value to the conversation. All right. Yeah. What about creativity and what about ethics? Thomas or Tarek, one of you. As think... skills for employability, can can AI uh, play the role of 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 creative director? better than humans in the way that marketing campaigns of the future will be? No. I'm not equipped to answer that question fully. <laughs> I'm not. To, 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 so <laughs> so I, I, can, I can tell you about re very recent research. Uh, I was actually yeah. interviewed uh, Cédric Théo at the University de, de Trois-Rivières. So his thesis was, uh, was precisely that. 
uh, images, uh, even though we can do permutations, unlimited permutations, does it mean that we're gonna be able to reach the audience in the same way that uh, an art director, she or he could could accomplish in terms of the emotions that we're, we're, we're trying to get to? And uh, he, he gave me some very funny examples. He was talking about, uh, and language it also is another barrier to that. So in French, you have lawyer and avocat, and he, he ran that through the system and you had you had an avocado, avocado sitting at a table, yeah. you know, yeah. and next to, yeah. So you, you, we're gonna see some of these things. I'm not saying that after a, a billion permutations that machines are not gonna catch up, but at this point, real, real artificial intelligence, not machine learning or natural language process, processing really push the, the high school or, or the primary school of real artificial intelligence. No, I think, Creativity still has uh, a place and, and it, it's a valued skill to have. I want to okay. add also that, Please, you know, yeah. connect to Tarek's point and to Thomas's point of connecting the dots. Like there's all this software, there's all of this advanced technology available, but there still needs to be a connection between it all. Because as we know, mm -hmm. integration is already hard with simple software. So yeah. how do you do that from a human you know, ideation to something uh, campaign worthy in marketing and yeah. also technology. So synthesizing all three of those and actually advocating for all three of those things at the same time while keeping your objectives in in like plain sight, that's a talent. That's a skill that mm -hmm. needs to be learned and developed and we'll keep we'll keep having to learn it. Yeah, good good creative ideas are usually the result of connecting the dots in the right yeah. way. Uh, and just really quickly on this topic, um, uh, jo I think the name is Joseph. Joseph Aoun is the president of Northeastern University. He wrote a book called Robot Proof. Uh, and he gives a, t uh, a talk online where he talks about this idea of employability. And he says that those skills that robots won't be able to do, he calls them humanics. And creativity and ethics and some other ones are in those. So marketers need to focus on humanics to be employable in the future. David, I, I'm just going to add yeah. if, you, if you'll allow. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So the elephant in the room, the ethics. Mm -hmm. The ethics is a very, very tricky topic because you have to ask yourself, given everything that we've seen, we've, we've been exposed to fake news, fake, fake documentation, fake profiles, fake CVs. Uh, and, and a lot of that it comes back to my previous comment, which is creativity and, and lying. When it comes to ethics, I think we have to also look at the machine ultimately may not be responsible the, the, the way that the law looks at it. However, the people that actually got the machine to that point are responsible. So I think I can't give you a straight answer on ethics. I don't know. But I think we're probably going to be exploring the people who directed those machines in that way. They're probably responsible. So I think, you know, the law is going to find a way to actually get that under control. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer, but I worked <laughs> mark in marketing for a law firm for a number of years. And so I was immersed in law and what you said there, that sounds, that sounds right. That sounds like a good prediction. The AI will not be charged with uh, any kind of uh, wrongdoing, but the people who created it could be. If I could just add as well to to just the whole the the concept of employability in this space, um, I think an increasingly valuable skill to marketers, and one that that I find flies under the radar sometimes is the ability to to manage all of these systems, implement them, and and kind of, I think, as we're all alluding to, you know, orchestrate them all, uh, you know, so a lot of these systems, as we move towards automated content creation, automated content distribution, um, it's very important that marketers understand how to properly implement these systems and, and make them work for the company that that they're at and their goals. Um, you know, it's it's these are very complex um, projects to put in place, sometimes taking months, if not years to make them work. Uh, and fine tuned to the point that they're they're really bringing value, and and it ends up becoming sometimes a dominant role for marketers is 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 actually 
being the one to manage and oversee these systems, even as more powerful they, as they become over the years, um, there has to be someone behind the wheel. And and you know the way the 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 position is pointed, uh, you know where that these systems are directed, it's often really at the the decision making uh, of the marketer, and it's all leaning on as Tarek has mentioned deeply the data and the the analysis of of what's coming uh, back at you from the use of these systems. So behind all the scenes of all of the the major um, you know components of today's marketing lies very powerful systems. Um, and, and really it becomes the crux of, uh, often a marketer's job. I, I'm, I'm just going to add to whatever Mike said, because it's so true. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a true story that happens between me and Mike. Most of the time, the, 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 every time I, I, I have a meeting with Mike, Mike pulls me away from the nitty gritties. And he's like, Tarek, your responsibility is to manage these systems and, and it because we as marketers sometimes we want to get her hand dirty as fast as possible we're like oh i want to run this i want to do this i want to get this done i want to and i we go deep in multiple silos and he's like Tarek, take a step to a few step backs and and we can set this up run it and see how it goes like take a few step backs try another venue and so what mike is telling you right now is not just telling you it's it's literally what he tells me almost on a bi-weekly basis like pulls me out and he's like Pay attention to a few these these few directions that you have. There's more than one way, or always looking from far. So I, I do agree on that fact that it's we over over we usually overlook it. But an ability for one marketer to have or marketers to utilize all this technology is one of the most important factors because we still need the human aspect to manage all this automation, no matter what. Totally agree. All right. So automation technology, uh, what, what other technologies do you think we can expect in the future, Tarek? What marketing technologies can we expect? Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, we're moving, at, we're, we're moving in, in a direction where I, I would say our work, not only from the marketing standpoint is, is being done. Also, I would say from the data standpoint is being done. Uh, Google Analytics, for example, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the future. I'm going to tell you about my experience in the past and what I've seen continuously happening. Uh, I wrote a book on analytics. So, you know, it. I, I gave it to you possibly the first time I saw you. I'm like, hey, you know, check it out. And in, in the book, I told in the book, I would talk about Google Analytics, Bing Analytics, data in general, web analytics in general. but the truth is this book was written two years ago. And then I wrote version two one year, one year ago, and now GA 4.0 went out. And a lot of the new analytics tool came out. And the work that we used to do when it comes, for example, tagging, um, doing specifics uh, on the site, coding, et cetera, that's actually taking a step back. Uh, we, we're no longer doing that as much because that's already Google taking that into account. Bing is taking that into account. So that's one aspect that I want to mention is uh, uh, there's the best way I can describe it is that there's a rise of the marketing technologists. So this is this is the best way I can describe it. And mm -hmm. when when I say that it's the marketers as marketers, we need to know we, we, we already have a lot of technology at our disposal. And for example, analytics is changing to become more accessible for us as marketers to put us in the driving seat. And a lot of things that used to be done by developers are moving more to marketers as well. So in, in a nutshell, I'll tell you the multiple hats that I wear. I wear a developer hat when I need to. And you can you can ask Mike, you can ask Mike about that. Like I built the blog that we, we have right now as a system. And I, and I love that because I get to create and do something. Literally, the blog that I've created a year and a half ago right now could be done in a completely different way and it can maybe a completely different updated way. So that's the one hat I wear. And the other hats I wear will be the SEO hat, the SEM hat, the content hat, the analytics hat. So from, from what I'm trying to tell you is there's technologies at, at, at every angle and the marketer of the future has to be able to change change hats as much as possible to be as successful as possible and to have to be able to sit in a room with developer and understand what they're saying sit with a, in a room with a content writer understand what they're saying and being able to actually use the information for his advantage sit with a room with an analytics expert and be able to use that to their advantage and that's that's what i would describe them 
the future technologies and marketing and any marketing technologist. Yeah. Any, any marketing program that was created today needs a course specifically on marketing technologies. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Ironically, ironically, we are, we are McGill and it's not a product, it is actually a product placement, but uh, McGill launched a course, which is going to be taught in the fall. I'm going to be teaching part of that course with other professors from McGill. And it's about marketing technology. So what technologies are we using in SEO? What technologies do we use in SEM? What technologies do we use in analytics? For example, we're going to go over all the auditing tools that we use in SEO, all the automation tool that we can use in uh, analytics, it, it, all the technologies that we have at our disposal. And for example, email automation, content automation, all of that. So um, I would say it was a very good initiative by the school to start this off. And, and uh, I, I love the course because we're getting the students are getting to try all the practical aspects. Like we're not, we're going to show them the tools. We're going to run a few tests right in front of them. And based on my experience, when yeah. these are, when these are being shared, students eat it up, they love it. So it's, yeah, it's most marketing issue. programs, especially from universities are more high level, more theoretical, we're not getting into tools. Yeah. That's something that's been missing. All right. I'm going to turn over to Michael. Michael, let's talk about your specialty. Uh, what do you see as the future of B2B? I think um, a, a very important aspect to B2B is, um, well, it, it all it all hinges on lead generation for us. And so, of course, yeah, our, our website really is the central engine of, um, you know, putting ourselves out there and and having people learn about us and, you know, becoming a lead for our sales team. And so as we look at new technologies in the B2B space, one of the things that I'm paying attention to right now the most is is kind of this concept of the mass personalization, you know, really of the web. And so now that, you know, we're in a world where really everything is tracked online and, and it's very accessible to track all of that data, um, how can we, we alter the website, um, you know, all of these pages to change depending on who's visiting? And, and technologies like that are, are actually, you know, much more accessible than really they seem. And, and I think this, this is, again, it's, it's a new system, you know, to be, to be looking at and, and it, it requires us learning how to implement this properly. Um, but it really pushes the envelope of, of how we in, in, in more of a B2B space can, can talk directly to, to prospects or customers when they're visiting our site and make sure that our messaging um, is very accurate and, and is speaking to, to the issues that they're having. Um, within the B2B space in general, really, our, our primary customer is, is Google. And, and we always need to make sure that, um, you know, our, we're visible um, for everyone that's doing research through Google or other search engines, um, because uh, that's really become, you know, the core of digital marketing for us and, and making sure that everything we do amounts to, you know, being visible through Google and, and, uh, and where a lot of the, um, people looking for business solutions and where they're doing their research, um, you know, we're, we're there where, where we need to be. So, um, you know, pushing our website, I would say is, is, uh, and in these ways is, is where we're focused right now. What would you say is is changing or has changed in lead generation? What do marketers need to do today that maybe they didn't need to do a year ago to generate leads, and how's that going to change? You know, I think it, it's um it's interesting. It, you know, just in a world of 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 marketing today, it, it always lands back on automation. Um, you know, because of course there's areas of content creation that um you know. It, it's we still need to create the roots of the system of of you know what's being used to 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 you know get ourselves out there, but um, in terms of lead generation, it, it often um, lands on on having a lot of consistency. And so, are you getting your message out there as frequently as possible? You know, there's only so much that you can do as one person, but you can deploy a system to you know email uh, a certain group of people. You know five times over over the course of a few months, you know, without you having to do it all yourself. And so it's very important that we 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 use all those systems as much as possible. Um, and the more you built into it, you know, it there's 
it's very important that we don't have a one size fits all you know, approach when we're sending out our messaging. So when we're talking about lead generation, even though you're using these widely deployed systems, the more personalized you can make it, the more you can fragment it out so that um, who you're talking to is relatable. Um, you know, we, we often find that um, we have more success. And at the end of the day, um, it, again, it always leads back into how are you analyzing the data of, of all of your campaigns? You know, because the better that you can test your systems, the better you can test your campaigns and, and actually take the time to look at and reflect at, at the performance of your campaigns, um, you know, the better you can adjust to make sure that, you know, the lead generation that's coming through on your site, um, you know, is working for you. And, uh, and again, I, I, would, I would lean back also on, on just what I said earlier. And, uh, you know, I think every marketer's best weapon is their website. Um, you know, everything has to revolve around, you know, how is your website working for your company um, to generate leads? And, and if it's not doing that for you, then, then I, I, you know, I think that that's always where to focus to make sure that it's, it's kind of ground zero for that. All right, I want to turn over to Aditi to talk about not-for-profit marketing. Where do you see the future of uh, not-for-profit marketing? Yeah, nonprofit is a really special space. It, I'm mm -hmm. coming from private and I've moved to nonprofit, and there's been a lot of learning there. Nonprofit, I'd say the main thing there is um, this, we're so mission-driven. So it's not just about here's a gift or here's like, you know, a case study and here's here's some information that can help you launch and that's that. And now you're, you've signed up and you've done your lead gen and I can call it a day. No, it's really tying back to our mission. So all of our messaging um, to Michael's point is consistent around our mission. So on social, what questions are we asking? How does it tie back to the mission? on our website what what are we saying on there and how does that tie back to the mission or bring our mission into that um and i i would say like the whole future i would say right now that's what it is is mission driven and because of that the future of nonprofit marketing is really based on your community networks and how you're utilizing your ecosystem around you because as a nonprofit, we, we don't have endless amounts of funds to just throw million dollar campaigns out, right? I'm, it's very different from private, but we have super solid partners in our ecosystem. So, you know, whether it's in Quebec and it's utilizing different startup environments there or different partners that lead off from ours. So, I mean, we help um, entrepreneurs aged 18 to 39 launch their business. Now, how can we supplement their launch with another partner in the ecosystem that can maybe boost a second round of funding or can pair them up with some sort of distributor or a supply chain system that is diverse and has a whole pool of different types of individuals to, to select from. So the future is really going to be all around how do you prioritize your partner landscape? How do you pitch in a way to them that is valuable for them while supplementing your own product. And I think it was, um, I think Thomas, you said this of like, what can we deliver uh, in order for the customer to be sufficiently happy and knowing though that it's the first version or the iteration. So I would say for nonprofit, we're always geared towards what's the next iteration? How do we get there? So don't, don't waste time on trying to build the car, right? Like if you have a skateboard of a, of a campaign or strategy right now, get to a bike. You don't need to get to the car, right? It's not a tire, tire, wheel system. It's okay, skateboard first. Now the next round will be uh, on the bike. And, you know, we've secured some sort of funding. We've secured key partners. Now the next iteration will be, you know, an e-bike maybe. And so it, it goes like that, where marketing really should be around how are you using your ecosystem? How does it supplement your product? How does it change the iteration? And how does it motivate your audience throughout that journey? All right, I wanna ask you another question. Uh, in the nonprofit sector, as well as in the corporate sector, in, in government, corporate, uh, around the world, equity, diversity, and inclusion has become more and more important it is, you know, it's on the agenda of most major organizations, nonprofit, it's major, majorly important. 
what do you think is the future of equity, diversity, and inclusion in marketing and for marketers? Oh, yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say that, you know, um, DEI work is never the same across two organizations, right? So that also sets the stage for what your marketing team is going to look like, is going to uh, need to fill gaps around and what they're prepared to do as a next step, right? Everyone's coming in with different levels of experience and um, familiarity around DEI. So there's, I wish I could say, oh yes, this is the trick, call it a day. We've all um, now successfully gone through, but I think for marketers in specific, it's, um, you know, the, we should steer away from creating these one-liners or zingers uh, in the space, right? Our mission is not to create the one-liners. Our mission is to create more advocates. So it's advocates out of your own team and advocates in your audience for the same, again, mission. And I sound like a broken record. I'm going to date myself here by saying record, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's that, right? Where you're trying to stay away from the theatrics and you're trying to post with purpose. And so... What does that look like? You know, what are the colors you're using? Um, what are the people or the stock imagery you're using? Are you making your own stock imagery? You know, so really, are you giving your team and yourself the time to train and understand regulations and improvements and resources around you? There's so much that the government already offers us in terms of training and trying to support DEI initiatives. So, you know, what? What are you doing right now to take hold of all those resources and move forward? So I think for marketers, give yourself the space, and I know that's hard, the space and the time to prioritize DEI work. When you do it, post with purpose and not for theatrics, and keep with your mission about advocates, not one-liners. I think that's um, how I would summarize yeah. that. I know I'm trying to be mindful of time here. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, from From my perspective, I actually was contacted recently by a PR firm that wanted to understand how the McGill School of Continuing Studies, what we do to attract more diverse students into the PR program because they want more diverse candidates. So I think as audiences become more diverse and if, if, if anyone here has looked at the statistics of, you know, we, we've talked for many years in Canada and North America about visible minorities uh, minority groups are growing in Canada, and uh, one firm that I know of called actually talks about the visible mi uh, majority. So as audiences become more diverse, there will be a lot more opportunities for diverse candidates in marketing and PR firms to do that work. Absolutely, and I mean we have um, in Futurepreneur. We have two programs, right? We have um, an indigenous entrepreneurship program and we have a black entrepreneur startup program that we recently launched in March and has been doing really great. But uh, for our indigenous program, we really had to go out and commit marketing dollars to um, photographing and documenting our entrepreneurs, our indigenous team and our entrepreneurs, because there's not a lot of stock image around that. And our mission is to represent everyone. So, you know, if you need to prioritize DEI over a simple stock image, please do it. You will never regret that. It will be a solid investment and you're then staying true to your core and your mission. So I, I really, um, that's my sprinkle of advice for future marketers there. Great, thank you. All right, we're gonna start taking some questions from the audience. The first one here is, is a degree in marketing or you know, is university education and marketing still required since there's so many online courses, you know, like Facebook blueprints and there's Google certifications and, uh, you know, there's no lack of, of training out there. Uh, where does a university degree or certification come, come in? Tarek, yeah, go ahead. I assume. Uh, <laughs> So um, I'm happy to answer the question. Uh, can I know the name of who, who answer, asked the question, if you don't mind? Uh, the question. Yes, it's Doha who asked the question. Doha. The Q okay, perfect, amazing. So Doha, nice to meet you. So I'll I'll tell you the truth. I'm a I've been I've been an, I've been a professor at McGill and Concordia for the past like three four years now. I've seen I've seen the world change. Like I, I was there uh, I was there Gandalf three thousand years ago. Like I was I was there when things were changing and before we 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 started automating things um, and before COVID. The truth is they both complement each other. Uh, when I teach my students at McGill, for example, uh, we, we don't only teach them 
how to use a tool. We use them, we teach them how to think, how to research, how to look for things, where to start, where to get started. We, we show them the real resources that they should pay attention to. The reason I'm saying this is because one, there's tons of resources out there. And as my grandma used to say, uh, don't believe everything you see on TV and don't believe anything you read online. I'm going to tell you this one, um, especially because there's a lot of experts out there. The, the, the good part about a university education is that centralized knowledge and that someone is actually genuinely giving their knowledge, their experience, their information. I give examples, for example, about Beats by Dre, about Apple, I give example about Global Vision. I give examples about a lot of things that worked in, in the past. So you get to inherit that knowledge. And usually all my students end up actually either finding a job or getting whatever they want to go in life. Now, that's a very good aspect. The truth is, even at McGill, I tell my students that's not enough. I tell them, go out, get your Google certification, get your Bing certification if you want to go that direction, go your and get your analytics certification, um, get your Facebook uh, blueprint certification. I do expose them to that level because I tell them, look, agencies or depending on where you want to go, do look at these certifications as well. So I would say they both complement each other. Um, university tend to have that uh, centralized value and it's a centralized source of information and it's their reputation. While Google and other resources are great, but they're great. Like uh, the way I describe it, it's like the hammer of Thor. They're great if they're concentrated in one area. But if you're just going to go out there and do everything and not know where you're going to go in the future, I swear to you, it's uh, it's like Thor without a hammer. Uh, I don't know if you watch Avengers, but here you go. There's a bit of I, I was I was waiting for you to to bring <laughs> up Avengers today because each time I see your right hand, I think it's the the glove of Thanatos. I swear, I told, I told, I told, the, so I molded this today and I told the person who did it there, I'm like, I told, oh my God, it looks like Captain America, uh, like uh, Iron Man's and I'm, like, I'm going to, am I going to be able to shoot spider webs out of it? And they started making fun of me and they're like, okay, Bloomer. It's like, okay, bye. <laughs> like, <laughs> so just so everyone knows his hand is broken. This is yeah. why he has the, yes. the, the glove. Yes. It looks, I mean, it looks like something like Darth Vader-esque because it's yes. black. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All that SEO um, work. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's 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 turned you over to the dark side. So back on the uh back on the <laughs> on the topic of education, I want to tackle this too because I work in education. It's one thing to to have skills that you can sell as a marketer to an employer or freelance or as a small agency. Um, but it also it's something completely different if you want to achieve a position like director of marketing in an agency. So when you've got the skills, you can get freelance work, you can start an agency, you can you can get an entry level job in a company. But if you want to be uh, in a high level position, you still need that degree. Um, another um, scenario that I would bring up because it comes uh, it comes up a lot. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who come to Canada from other countries and they get the surprise of finding out that their education from home is not recognized here and they're wondering what to do um and we found uh, you know I, I i meet a lot of people who came to canada their education wasn't recognized they didn't know what to do and they do a certificate at mcgill and that gives them something that suddenly makes their entire profile attractive because they've got a certificate it's from mcgill they then get their first job in canada so there's definitely still a place for for university education, and I think the university education gives one set of skills. Uh, you know, you usually aren't going to learn Facebook ads in university, but Facebook ads as the tool and as the platform and the the uh, you know the nitty gritty on the ground is one thing, but having the rest of the knowledge and understanding of how marketing works and how audiences can be influenced is critical. All right, so we have a question uh, once again about AI. At what point in the process do we want to turn a lead over from the machines to a human? When should a human take over in the sales process? Who'd like to tackle that one? Well, this is, uh, this is something that we deal with on a daily basis. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but I think that, you know, it ultimately, it ultimately does 
rely on on your audience and the, the data that comes from it. There's there's if you treat it like a funnel, you know, when when people first come and, and ask questions, um, you know, it's it's often, you know, a very general bucket and, and it gets more defined as there's there's um you know they give information about what they're coming for. And so um it generally tends to be within the first few kind of interactions that you can start to then look at handing it off. Um, but what's great about having the first few interactions automated is it is it just acts as as a filter, uh, you know, a first pass of, you know, are there people uh, who's really interested in talking to, you know, and becoming a lead or, you know, who's just kind of passing through and um, it just helps, you know, uh, then making sure that if you do have those first few, um, you know, you're, you're, you're passing the most qualified leads over to, to your sales team and you're focusing everyone's time. So, you know, that ends up becoming really a good picture of the balance between, you know, AI and automation and, and, and what it can really, really help with in, in, in today's world for sure. Yeah. And it's true that as much as, you know, we can have automated campaigns. We, you know, from, from a social platform or Google to a landing page, to emails, to text messages that can all be automated. But in many cases, especially for high ticket items or services, you still need a human to close the deal. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone. Thank all of you for being here tonight. I want to thank our panelists for giving us their thoughts. Uh, and, uh. Have a wonderful night. I wish everyone best of luck in the future of marketing. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you for Thanks having us. Ciao. Thank you. Have a great Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Good night.